Would you turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 12 through 17? That's where we're going to be camping for the next three to five hours. <laughs> um, amen. No. Uh, and while you turn to that area of the Bible, I just want to say, baptisms gets me, just gets me really hyped up, and gets me really excited, because it's cool to see God move, amen, and hear about how God is moving, especially in our young people. There's, there's such a move of God happening in our young people, and it gets me really excited. Also, I get a front row seat of, of all of it. I was the one who was preaching on Revelations. <laughs> so, but my nieces and nephews always call baptisms baptisms, and so it's really cool to see Jesus' blood wash us of our sins. No? Okay, that's funny. But we've been in a series on relationships and uh, Neil Campbell talked about how about family and how family is one of the most important places for discipleship. And then previously, uh, Pastor Mark shared on community and how we're called to live in community. And today, I have the great honor and privilege of, of speaking on friendship. And so it'll be uh, hopefully good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's dive into it. But before we do, let's, uh, let's pray together. So Jesus, we just thank you for uh, the amazing opportunity to to speak your word. And God, I just pray that my voice would be really quiet and your voice would be incredibly loud, that whatever you need to speak to these people, that they would hear it. Not my voice, but yours, Lord. Uh, help me get out of the way of what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So at Young Adults, uh, we have a Young Adults Gathering on Tuesdays. Young Adults on Tuesdays, it's, it's good times, good fun. But we've been in a series this February talking about relationships as well. And, but we've titled it uh, Spouse Hunters uh, because we know that many of our young adults really love attending young adult services, not necessarily for the gospel, but for the potential of spouses. Okay, that's a reality we live in, so I'm just trying to work with what we got, okay? Um, and so that's why we called it Spouse Hunters, also loosely based on the show House Hunters. Anybody seen House Hunters? You know that show, House Hunters International? Venice, anyone on the water? No? Um, but House Hunters is probably one of the most irresponsible shows that I've ever watched in my life. And this is why, okay, this is, this is why it's so irresponsible, is because you have the, the husband and the wife, and they're looking for a house, and it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But the husband is a water polo expert, and he makes 13K a year, and the wife is a, a, bu a bug photographer who makes 5K a year, okay? She's freelance, she's working on the side, it's okay. But their budget is 3.4 million. And they're looking for a five-bed, five-bath on the water, seaside, semi-detached garage. Like, that's what they're looking for with a, a full in-suite, you know, like a suite in the basement so that they can, it's got to be an income suite, otherwise they can't afford it, right? But this is what they're looking for. But what, I, what I've figured out is sometimes this is the way that we approach our friendships and our relationships is we don't necessarily have the budget. We haven't worked hard enough on ourselves, but we're expecting the most amazing friends or the most amazing marriage. And so it's important that even before we have the conversation of what's a good friend and like what does it mean to be a good friend is are you prepped and ready to be a good friend? Have you done some introspection and, and discovered maybe your flaws? Have you, have you done that introspection and realized, maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe my budget's a little high for the work that I've done in my own life? Amen? So Colossians 3 says this, and this is, this is Paul's encouragement to increase your budget, increase your relational budget. It says this, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy, kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So in preparation to finding deep friendships, we need to clothe ourselves in love. We need to clothe ourselves in mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and peace to prepare us for the relationships that God has set, up, set before us. You know what I mean? And so if we've, if we've done the introspection, if we've, if we've prepared ourselves, if we've clothed ourselves in love, humility, all those things, how do we even find a friend? How do we find good, good friendships? Other people who have also done the legwork and the preparation work in order that they would be a good friend. Well, let me tell you, the church is a great place to be. If you're looking for friends and you're looking for good friendships, set yourself up by 
being a part of the church because the church serves to build community. That's part of what we, what part of the purpose of the church is, is to build community. And that's why we have youth services and young adult services and kids services and 50 plus ministry and men's ministry and women's ministry and our community care network that's happening that Norell is heading up. And those are the reasons because we want to build a community of good, good friends that can support each other. Because biblical friendship isn't purposeless friendship. It has a purpose. And some of the purposes are these. The first purpose that I notice in a biblical friendship is for the purpose of edification. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. When we're discouraged and we have friends, they can edify us. They can build us up and encourage us with the truth. It's funny because I have a friend named Levi. He's my, my best bud and love him to bits. And the reason that I love him <laughs> is because I can call him at any time and he will speak truth over me. I can call him when I'm feeling discouraged or can't see the truth and he will remind me of who I am in Christ and who God's created me to be. Isn't that beautiful? And that's, that's what we get when we, when we build these friendships is we build an edification network that can speak truth. Not, not your truth, but God's truth over you. Amen? Another reason that biblical friendships exist is for accountability. It says in Matthew 18, 15, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. If we don't have accountability in our lives, we are setting ourselves up for failure. If you're riding a boat? What do you do? Sailing a boat, right? It's sailing, you don't ride boats. Thanks, Norrell. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a nautical person, okay? But if you're sailing a ship, it changed from a boat to a ship. That's interesting. The size got bigger. Um, but if you're sailing a ship and you set your, your course and you're one degree off, after 500 kilometers, you'll be way off course. And if you don't have someone in your life to point out that you're one degree off course, you're going to rob yourself of some of the purposes that God has for you. And you might even find yourself buried in a, in a pit of sin because you haven't been corrected. And so it's important that we, one, make ourselves available to correction and to this accountability with our friends. It's really hard to receive accountability and constructive cr criticism from a complete stranger. And so I would rather have a friend come and correct me in love and say, hey, I think you're a little bit off course and you need to go in this way where God is calling you to be. So biblical friendships are for edification, for accountability, but also for prayer. When you step into the church, when you step into the community of the church and you build friendships within the church, you also step into a prayer network. A beautiful prayer network. James 5 says this, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. It's been cool in my own life to see how the prayer network has come in full force and supported us. Uh, my daughter Charlotte has asthma, and so when she gets sick, it gets a little bit dicey because she just can't catch her breath because of the sickness in her lungs, and so she's been to the hospital a couple of times for it. But it's cool because every time that she goes to the hospital, I can send one text, and I know that I have literally hundreds of people praying with me, believing for my daughter to get well or believing for the situation and circumstance. And so when you buy into the community, when you spend some of those relational chips that you've earned and buy into this community, you get access, not, it's not something you have to pay for, but you have access to this beautiful prayer network of people believing in faith for your circumstance to change or maybe your perspective on the circumstance to change. So it's so cool to have biblical relationships where people are praying with each other. But let me tell you, I caution you, don't turn the prayer network into a gossip network. Because sometimes we take the prayer network and say, this is my opportunity to share. Have you heard about Jimmy and his unspokens? He's got so many. You know? That's not what the purpose of the prayer network is. The prayer network is really to believe in faith for God's circumstance, not to share the inner workings of people's lives, but to pray and believe in faith for God to move. 
Another very, 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 very important thing in biblical relationships is to have fun. We're supposed to have fun in the church. Amen? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I believe. No, you don't. Come on. <laughs> like, have fun. That's why we dunk people. It's like, dunk. Woo, dunk. Yeah. Because the church is supposed to be fun because Jesus died and rose again, defeated death so that we could have life and life to the full. And part of fullness of life is joy, the joy of the Lord. No one's excited about that? That's fine. I'm excited. I'm excited to have fun. I'm excited that heaven's going to be a constant party. I'm excited to sing praises and to, to my Savior. Okay, that's fine. The church should be a party because we understand what we've been pulled out of by the goodness and mercy of God. The cool thing is, is when biblical friendships happen in the church, what ends up happening is there's unity there. Because when we have these biblical friendships with edification, accountability, prayer, and fun, unity starts to form in the church. And I'm proud to say that BP has been a fairly unified church over its long-standing history. There's never been a church split, and that's a beautiful representation of the unity of this church. But that is something that we're actually called to. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says this, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So we're called. It's not something that we just hope happens. It's actually something that we've been mandated to, to participate in, in the unity of the church. <sighs> Has anyone been to Italy before? You might be thinking, why is this man talking about Italy? I'm not sure, but we're there. <laughs> we're together in it, unified in the fact that I just randomly started talking about Italy. I've never been to Italy. Um, <laughs> I do, though, order Italian urban cheese at Subway. <laughs> Taste of Italy, you know? Um, but if you, and maybe your spouse or your partner or whatever, like if you guys you and your friend, your business partner, whatever, traveled to Italy with two different purposes in mind, okay? Two different ideas of what's going to happen on this trip. The reality is you're, you're not going to get anything done because you're constantly going to be at odds with each other trying to figure out what you're going to be doing. I want to go see the Colosseum. I want to just sit and drink coffee all day. Like, nothing's going to ever happen. And this is what happens to the church is sometimes when disunity enters, the purpose is robbed, so when disunity enters the church, when disunity enters the house of the Lord, the purpose of the church is robbed because we cannot move forward if we aren't unified. And this is what 1 Corinthians is talking about. So let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. We need to be united in thought. We need to say, yep, I know that Christ came, died for my sins, rose again, defeated death, and now his spirit lives in me. And so I have the authority that he had. Amen? So we need to be united in that thought, but then also united in purpose. And this is what BP Church is all about, is reaching 1% of North Calgary. And you've heard of Fope talk about it. You heard of Brandon talk about it, even in just this morning. Because we want to be united in this purpose that God has called us to, to reach 1% of North Calgary, to fulfill the Great Commission of Matthew 28, to do all these things and be a church on fire for Jesus, reaching people around us. Amen? But when we focus on church politics or the nitty-gritty or participate in the gossip train, like if we do those things, nothing's going to happen because disunity is going to disband and that we cannot accomplish our purpose. And so it's so important that we maintain unity, but how do we do that? The first thing I think is to posture ourselves with the Spirit and say, Lord, would you baptize my mind? Would you renew my mind? Would you create in me a new person, make me a new creation? And, and prepare me, as it says in Ephesians, for the good works, because I am your masterpiece, and I just want to do your good works. It says in Romans 12, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. First step of maintaining unity in the church is to be humble. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. That's what Romans 12 says. 
So we need to maintain humility as we try and accomplish the common purpose uh, that God has called us to. See, the problem is, is when we when we bring pride into a situation, we're no longer serving what God is calling us to do. We're serving ourselves. So um, unity and pride can't coexist. They can't be in the same space because you're no longer serving Christ. You're serving yourself. The next thing we need to do to maintain unity in the church is to offer forgiveness. It said in Colossians 3 to extend forgiveness because the Lord forgave you. Matthew 18 says, Then Peter came and asked the Lord. This is Peter talking to Jesus. Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Which was a lot. And Jesus replied, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Which is basically just a way of saying, like, listen, man, just extend the forgiveness. Even if the person doesn't deserve it, extend the forgiveness. And I think that's probably one of the more challenging things to do is to extend forgiveness when someone doesn't deserve it, eh? It's so incredibly difficult. Michaela was preaching at youth uh, one evening on a Friday night, which is when youth is. Now I'm rambling, but that's okay. Michaela was preaching, and she said, if we are harboring unforgiveness or holding on to unforgiveness, it's like drinking poison and expecting the poison to affect the other person. And so this unforgiveness, not only does it cause disunity, but it also is like a seed of disunity in our own life where it just starts to wreck us. And so extend the forgiveness even when the person doesn't deserve it. Because I think when we extend that forgiveness, we also experience the peace of God. And that would be probably the third thing that we need to do in order to maintain unity is to seek out peace. It says in Colossians 3.15, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace, and always be thankful. We need to seek peace as the body of Christ. So what about outside the church? Like we've talked about these friendships inside the church, and but it should we have friends outside of the church? Is that something we should do? Well, yeah, absolutely. But the challenge is, is we can't maintain unity with our friends outside of the church because they're, they're not following what God is calling you to do. They're not following what God has called as this high standard. And so sometimes we try and maintain unity with the world to salvage these friendships outside of the church, but God is actually calling us to be above that, to be at a higher standard and... But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have friends because we need to have friends outside the church so that we have the relational credits to witness to people. Because I believe that relational evangelism, where I've built rapport with someone, where I have the relational credits in order to speak into their lives, is the most effective way to witness to people around you. We were in a service, the last service, Rudy was baptized, and it was just a beautiful, powerful story of how he felt convicted to be more and more like Jesus in his life. And he said, when I started to accept that God was the Lord of my life, I had people coming to me asking for advice, and I had the boldness to pray for them. See, Rudy is exemplifying what it looks like to have a missional lifestyle, an intentional lifestyle, not shying away from the truth of Jesus Christ, but really saying, listen, yeah, absolutely. I have a stake in this relationship too, but let me, let me tell you, the gospel of peace is so much better than the way that you're living. Rudy understands what it means to have friends outside of the church. He understands that we are called to live as representatives of Christ, to try our best to reflect Jesus in the best way that we can. Colossians 3.17 ends like this. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And so our calling, both in our friendships, in the church, and outside of the church, is to live as a representative of Christ Jesus, to reflect him in the best way we can. And it's interesting because in this world of chaos, the, the world needs peace. And, and the cool part is, is Jesus is called, as we heard, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And so what we see today is a world that is desperate for the peace of God, but they don't know how to get it. They are desperate. 
with all the anxiety, the depression that's rampant, the, the wars that are going on, all these different things, the world is desperate for the gospel message, the peace of God that transcends all understanding, but they have no way of knowing how to get it. And so it's our job, our calling, our mandate to be peace bringers in every situation that we walk in. Something I love about Jesus is when he walked into a room, he walked in with peace. He brought peace into a room. And so we're called to be a reflection of Jesus, a representative of him, and a peace bringer in every situation that we go in. And I think it can be difficult to, uh, to maintain this peace. To Like I think about in early 2020 with, with COVID and all that stuff that was happening, I just felt overwhelmed by by. Like, man, it just felt like the world was falling apart. And I'd, I couldn't feel like I had the peace with me. Because it was just like, man, what is happening? And I remember somebody saying to me, Ben, I understand. I understand that you're overwhelmed. And I understand that you can't see how this is going to work out. And I understand that your circumstance might even be really crazy. And, 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 but you serve a God who is still seated on the throne who has all authority, who's all-knowing, who can do all things, and he is always faithful. And so in that moment, I'm like, oh, I can still have peace even when my circumstance changes because I serve the Prince of Peace who is above it all. My peace endures because of God's enduring nature. Amen? Mark, if you want to come up and we'll sing a song or two or five. 27, if you're feeling Pentecostal. Um, come on, somebody. So we need to have friends within the church for edification, for accountability, for prayer, for fun. That's, that's the purpose of biblical friendships. And those biblical friendships create unity in the church which we're called to. We're called to live unified in thought and in purpose, to reach 1% of North Calgary. And the best way for us to witness is to be in relationship with unbelievers and to allow our testimony to represent Christ and the transformation that he's done. It's so cool hearing baptisms again because it's testimonies of how God has been faithful, how God has redeemed, how God has brought people into life and life to the full. That gets me fired up. And if, if you've heard anything about, uh, there's like a bit of a revival going on in the States right now, and I, I just really feel like God's on the move. And we need to participate. We need to get involved. Like my, my prayer, my personal prayer, is like, Lord, help me not get in the way. Help me not get in the way. Maybe even allow me to participate in what you're doing. Because I want to see you move in power. I want to see you change the world. I want to see how, how you can transform every single life in Calgary. Because I believe that a unified church filled with intentional peace bringers will radically change the world. A unified church filled with intentional peace bringers, people who are willing to, to step into the mess and say, I've got the gospel of peace for you will radically change the world. And you know what? We can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. But the song that uh, Pastor Mark is going to sing it speaks to that, that God's name is power. His name is healing, and his name is life. It's not Ben's name. It's not my story. It's not my testimony. It's, it's God who is seated above it all, who can do all things. Amen? My peace endures because of his enduring nature. Let's stand and sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus to every dark.
dark addiction starts to break To bury there is hope and there is freedom Jesus, I just pray that if there are people in this room who are having difficulties experiencing your peace, that you would just begin to speak to them now. If there's anxiety or depression in their brain, God, I just pray that you bring healing. Lord, that the peace that transcends all understanding that only can come from you would reside in all of us today. And Jesus, I just pray that you would give us the boldness, the boldness to live in a way similar to Rudy, where we're unashamed of the gospel and willing to pray with those who don't even believe. God, that we would be a unified church full of intentional peace bringers that would see our church, our city, our nation, and our world changed. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.